Oui, bonjour. Et merci de me donner l'opportunité de présenter là sur notre instrument. Euh, donc tout le monde me connaît par mon nom euh, anglais, H.J. Donc euh, oubliez le nom euh, allemand long. Et c'est tout ce que je vais dire en français parce que mon français n'est pas tellement bien. So I'll switch to English for the rest of the presentation. So I'm going to talk about the delta ray isotope ratio infrared spectrometer. It uh, consists essentially of two parts, the analyzer and the universal reference interface. So in the first part of the presentation, I will talk to you about how it actually works, if you haven't heard about that yet. And then I'll talk about what the universal reference interface adds in terms of performance before then diving into the applications that probably interest you most. So isotope ratio infrared spectroscopy is the, the name I'm using for all the optical methods, Fourier transform, uh, cavity ring down, everything you you've may ever have heard of. So it's the, the whole method. But they all rely on the same principles. Uh, they use uh, optical methods and not a sector magnet to uh, determine the isotope ratios. Now, how does it work? Here is shown um, so where was the pointer? Uh, the line strength. So that's a property of a molecule that's listed in spectral databases that uh, uh, optical spectroscopists like. And it's shown from about one micron to five micron um, in wavelength range. And uh, in green are shown the uh, line strength is the property of a molecule to absorb light. And in green are shown from the, minus, the main isotope log, the 12, 16, 16, 0. In red, uh, 13, C, uh, 16, 0, 16, 0. And then also in blue, the 18, 0. Now you notice that um, the, the red one is about a, uh, 100 times, or oh, this is a logarithmic scale. So the 13 C is about 100 times less strong. This is actually not um, because the absorptions are uh, that weak, but it's the typical natural abundance. So these lines are scaled by the typical natural abundance. So you see that um, if you measure here in, in the uh, at about 4.3 microns, you can actually get 13 C, 18 O, and the 12 C isotopologues at the same time. Another thing to notice is that uh, in the mid-infrared, you have about 8,000 times stronger lines than, than here at 1.6 micron, uh, commonly used wavelengths for these um, kind of measurements. Now, what looks like bands are actually hundreds and hundreds of individual lines. They are due to quantum mechanics, these rotational and vibrational states of the molecule that create the absorption of the light are quantized. So now I'll try to uh, zoom in so you oh, my mouse. I'll try to zoom in so you can see um, how this looks. And now you start seeing individual transition. And we keep on zooming in more uh, to, an, to about the range that one individual laser scan can cover. So uh, you have a tunable diode laser that can cover about these lines. And you see you can get a 13C and 18O and also the 12C um, lines in, in one laser scan. So that's fundamentally um, how it works. Now let's look a little bit at the detection axis in the laser. Um, the optical core that where the, the analysis occurs is inside a temperature uh, controlled uh, enclosure. And here you see kind of inside uh, the guts of the analyzer. Um, here is the laser head. So we use what's called difference frequency generation. So we have actually two near-infrared lasers and then a crystal here, a nonlinear crystal, that converts the light to the mid-infrared. Um, let's look a little bit at the whole optical core here. So this is the mid-infrared laser head that I told you about. And then you can see how the light is being transferred over to the multipass cell, where the laser beam bounces, uh, it enters through a hole in the mirror. And then it bounces back and forth about 13 times uh, before it comes out of a hole in the back mirror and then gets collected on a Mercat Telluride uh, mid-infrared uh, light detector. These mirrors, something to note, are regular mirrors. You can actually see yourself in them. Well, except that they're actually slightly focusing. But um, so your, your image is a little distorted, but they're regular mirrors. They also work if they're slightly dirty, if you have some uh, contamination that may happen to come into the, 
cell here, uh, the, 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 the method will still work. You may decrease the precision a little bit, but it's not gone. So there's no requirement for super reflective mirrors in this uh, setup. The other thing to note is it's really a monolithic design. All these mirrors are glued in pace, place, so that's a telecommunication technology that we employed here. So this is all very robust. You can um, shake it and, and nothing happens. There's nothing to adjust. Uh, the other thing I want to point out is, like most of these optical uh, analyzers, they operate in a flow-through mode. Uh, meaning there's a continuous flow of sample through the cell where the interaction of the light with the sample occurs. So in our, uh, uh, our specifically in our analyzer, it's about 80 milliliters per minute that continuously flow through. And so that also means if you have a change in your sample, it takes some time for that to really show up in the signal because first you need to completely replace the uh, sample in, in the cell. So that's something to keep in mind that's quite different from a mass spec uh, setup, uh, the typical mass step setup. And so this is the raw data as we measure it with the, with the delta ray. It's an absor laser absorption spectrum. So without any CO2 in the air, you would get kind of just this curved line here. And these bumps are the light that's taken out by the CO2. This is from the 18O, the 13C, the 12C. And we fit this spectrum uh, completely. So we fit these line shapes and then retrieve the areas. And from those, we can calculate the isotope ratios. But not only can you calculate the isotope ratios, because we also have zero and kind of an absolute calibrated transmission spectrum, we can also determine the concentration. So you get three things in one shot. Concentration, 13C, 18O. Now, another thing to keep in mind is we scan the spectra, we, we scan the laser internally at 500 hertz. So every two milliseconds, we get an isotope ratio. Well, except we can't fit that fast. So we actually average for one second, but it's truly a, an average of um, one second and of each line. So uh, there is no worry about uh, rapidly changing concentrations or isotope ratios that would get weird results if you sit on this line for a while and then on that line. We continuously scan the laser. So I've showed you how a mid-infrared platform is pretty simple and you get a very good um, performance uh, out, out of it, so good precision by doing that. And now what does the URI, the Universal Reference Interface, add? It essentially provides you with verifiable and calibrated data. At the core of the URI is what we call the MIT, a mixing and switching device. It's a, a micro-machine precision engineered um, piece of equipment that allows you to mix the different uh, gases. Uh, now, why would you do that? Um, let me summarize kind of the functional layout of the Universal Reference Interface. It has several things. It uh, takes the sample and dries it. Well, why would you dry the sample? There's two reasons, matrix effects. So the line shapes of the spectra that I showed you are actually slightly dependent uh, on the matrix you're measuring in. Water being the thing that changes most in the ambient air um, uh, would create matrix effects. The other thing is the CO2 water oxygen exchange. So, 18O of water exchanges obviously with 18O of CO2, as all of you may know if you're familiar uh, with that kind of, that's actually the method how you analyze the water oxygen isotopes, uh, you convert it to CO2. So you don't want water in your analyzer to prevent any exchange there. Now the, the, what, what we use the MIT for really is to match the concentration of the sample to that of uh, the reference gas. So we dilute the reference gas, which is a pure CO2 with synthetic air, which is CO2 free air, and uh, match the concentration. With that, you can take out any nonlinearities or drifts that occur in all the analyzers. Actually, mass specs have that, and all the optical methods have it as well. And so, with, when, you, when you do that, you can really leverage the power of uh, the laser based methods. And then you run all that, of course, uh, over into the analyzer. Uh, one thing I forgot to say actually here is this is a spectrum at 380 parts per million. So it works really well at ambient concentration, room air or outside air. You already get some 80% absorption. Uh, so really nice and strong signal at uh, 380 parts per million. <coughs> 
So now what performance can you get uh, typically with this? But if you average for about one minute, the precision on 13C is better than 0.15 uh, per, per mil and 0.2 on 18O and the concentration precision is like 70 parts per billion out of 400 ppm or 380 typically. Uh, and then when, you've, when you use the reference interface and our standard workflows that we recommend and you look at one hour average over 24 hours a day, you can see that the scatter in those hourly averages is less than 0.05 per mil. So you can really get uh, accuracy, a reproducibility that's getting pretty close to what a mass spectrometer can do. And you can do that day in, day out. And so this is the combination. So the kind of the short term precision is really the mid infrared technology and the uh, long term reproducibility is what you get from the uh, from the uh, reference interface. Notice the minimum integration time is one second. So the mi you can get delta values every second if you care. Um, but keep in mind, as I mentioned, the sample replacement time is actually more like 30 seconds. So they're not truly independent data points, but you will see a transition if you go from one to the other. You know, you'll see about 31 second points that it changes and then it arrives at the new uh, final value when the sample is fully replaced in the measurement cell. So now we try to make sure that it measures accurately. Uh, and how did we do that? How do you do that? So, we took uh, synthetic air and CO2 externally to the analyzer. I mean, I mentioned the URI has this capability as well, but we did another setup just externally where we took pure CO2 synthetic air and diluted it to um, create some ramp of CO2 concentration as a function of time. So we can change the amplitude and we can make this, the ramp faster or slower, kind of whatever we want. And we've used that to simulate typical um, environments. Uh, that you would see when you take measurements. Then uh, in parallel, we analyzed the isotopic composition of this pure CO2 also in the traditional mass spec and uh, got the 13C and 18O. And of course, in the delta ray, we get the concentration and 13C and 18O. Here, an ambient simulation. So this is like your background monitoring station. You may just have read the news that the CO2 increased uh, again more than typically in 2013. And uh, so to monitor this kind of stuff, you measure in a background station uh, continuously. Here we have uh, like a um, 75 ppm per hour change of the concentration. So we ramped it up and down to simulate this rate of change. That's not atypical for an ambient monitoring station. And as you expect, the, uh, the retrieved CO2 isotopic composition got to be flat. Well, it's always the same CO2 going in. And so, so it's for 13C and 18O, it's flat. And the standard deviation of these 25-minute uh, averages is like 0.05 per mil. And if you now compare that with the value that we retrieve with the mass spectrometer, it's within the analytical uh, precision. The average value retrieved by the delta ray is the same as that from the delta 5 IRMS. Now we cranked it up a notch and said, well, let's simulate a plant chamber where the ch rate of change is much faster. So here we went, went with like uh, 20 parts per million per minute uh, change. And we went from 380 parts per million to three and a half thousand parts per million. And uh, so the time resolution here is much higher. So that explains why there's a bit more scatter in the data. So it's about 0.1 per mil, the standard deviation. And there's no obvious correlation of the uh, of, of the, the retrieved delta value with the concentration. Um, but so it shows that even for these fast changing uh, signals with, with the URI together, we can uh, take out any nonlinearities and get good results. And if you again compare the average value with the IRMS, it's a ridiculously good agreement between the two methods. Now let's dive a bit into applications before we wrap it up. One is a plant chamber application where you have a continuous flow of air through a chamber that contains the plant. We have a valve where we can look at inlet and outlet and so we can study the signal that's imposed by the plant on the CO2 isotopic composition. And here is shown first, there's about two weeks of data. Uh, actually, at the beginning of the experiment, they stopped watering the plant, so putting it under water stress. And you see the 18O signature uh, over time. So they you know, turned the lights on in this plant chamber. And that's where the photosynthetic activity occurs. 
and you see in uh, the this lower line here is the in and uh, the, the other one is the outline so you see a difference th that's being imposed by the isotopic uh, by the f uh, photosynthesis same here on the 13c versus time you see that over time the photosynthetic activity gets smaller and smaller it's because essentially the plant is dying um, then here is a diff, there was a second analyzer uh, hooked up and uh, here's kind of an average, uh, here's the differences between the two and uh, there is some difference on average that's related to the uh, uncertainty of the reference gases. Now the actual setup was much more complicated so there was another, uh, oops, sorry, there's another uh, um, analyzer that measured the 18O composition and also a water isotope analyzer and we made the delta ray a slave of this whole setup. So we didn't actually switch the valve, so this, the valve was being switched and we just received the uh, signal from the outside. So you can uh, make it a slave of an existing setup and uh, fit it right in. And the data was then sorted by uh, the in and out automatically in the software. Other application, the greenhouse gas monitoring uh, that I mentioned before. Here you see uh, the, uh, the red curve is the 13C with the left axis, again about two weeks of data. On the right side, hand side, the concentration uh, with the black curves. Two events, this one here where the concentration went up to 50, 450 ppm, the 13C got quite a bit more negative. If you do a keeling plot on this, it comes to about minus 32 per mil, so that's some uh, combustion event. Another interesting event here is this drawdown where CO2 concentration goes down and uh, the, CO, the 13C becomes more positive. Remember what that is? Photosynthesis. So even though this was at 60 meters altitude, the air was taken in here, uh, we see influence of the local uh, vegetation. We can see these events. Now if you consider that in the past, you would measure this like with one flask a day and then analyze it in the lab, you can immediately see that during these days here, it may actually have been good to use flasks, but here, if you measure one of these days, you completely miss what's going on. And so the feature-rich data, this 24 hours, seven days a week uh, data sets really make a difference that you can put things in context. You can also do um, carbon storage research. So here they injected CO2 underground in a pilot site and then watched the plume move under Ground. There's an injection well and an observation well, about 600 meters underground under a cap rock layer. And then before we started, they started to inject, we started, before we started measuring, they injected isotopically different CO2 and then watched that move underground. And uh, this is kind of a picture of the setup, the injection well, the observation well, and back here the container where we had the analyzer. We actually diluted the signal because it was pretty pure CO2 and above 3,500 ppm we have trouble uh, with saturation, so we diluted. Here the results, the CO2 concentration was between 80 and 95 percent. And you see how the 13C signal here uh, gets positive, more positive over time. This is this isotopically different signal arriving. Then here we had a blowout. Actually first uh, CO2 was bubbling up through water and uh, we didn't get the direct signal. And after the, blow, the pressure got high enough and blew out the water, uh, especially in the 18O, you see a huge jump because it's not affected by the water that much anymore. There's some high frequency signals here that still are being investigated. Again, showing you if you just do flasks, you may miss part of the action. And I think the most exciting one was uh, on top of Mount Etna, where we run it out, out of the back of a SUV. And uh, why would you do that? The isotopic C composition of CO2 from a volcano uh, changes depending on the depth. So from deeper down, it's about one per mil different. And we wanted to show that we can detect this change by just measuring in the plume, so not necessarily as close as possible to the source. So what we did here is we see the concentration on the top, the 13C at the bottom, background where not much was happening, then we, this was actually a fumarole, but anyway, you, you see CO2 increase by about 100 ppm, 150 ppm, and you see how the, um, the, the 13C changes towards a volcanic value. We can extrapolate actually to about a precision of 0.1 per mil, and uh, except for these points here where its concentration goes up, but the 13C goes down where we actually sampled a little bit of the car exhaust that got carried to the analyzer. It's published in a GRL paper if you care to know more about it. Summarizing it, 
So we build on 60 years of experience with IRMS. You get concentration 13C and 18O in one shot. You include the reference interface to give you the long-term stability. It works very well at 380 ppm. You can get 0.05 per mil precision. It's field deployable. You get these feature-rich data sets that tell you a lot about your experiments. Uh, we have software that I didn't talk much about it. And you get out-of-the-box results. I mean, you set it up and start measuring right away. So I would like to acknowledge all the people from Erlangen and Potsdam that helped with the carbon storage stuff. The Forschungszentrum Jülich was involved in the plant chamber measurements. The University of Groningen had the uh, ambient background station. And then, of course, the team from Palermo, uh, with, with whom I did the measurements on Etna. So what's next? We're excited to see where you're going to take a delta ray to do your research. Um, but this is obviously also just the beginning of this whole thing. So what should this type of analyzer do in the future? I'd be happy to talk to you at the booth or poster session or coffee, um, whatever. I'm here for the rest of the day and also tomorrow till about midday. So thanks for your attention.